We have now all experienced quarantine. Now, imagine being quarantined, but if you are discovered, your family will most likely be killed. This is the story of Anne Frank. Part 1. The Diary On your note paper, think about the following statement. I would risk my life for my family. Do you agree, disagree, or are you in between? Explain your answer and pause the video, if you need to. On June 12, 1942, Anne Frank's parents gave her a small red and white plaid diary for her 13th birthday. More than 50 years later, the diary has become one of the best-known memoirs of the Holocaust. When Anne received her diary, she and her family were living in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, which is occupied by the German army. By Anne's 13th birthday, she, like every other European Jew, was living in fear of the Nazis and their anti-Jewish decrees. On July 6, 1942, her family was forced to go into hiding. Although they could take very few things with them, Anne brought her diary to her new home, which she called the Secret Annex. For the two years that Anne lived in the annex, she wrote down her thoughts and feelings. She wrote about her life with the seven other people in hiding. Her parents, her sister, the Van Pels family, called the Von Don by Anne, and Fritz Pfeffer, called Alfred Dussel by Anne, as well as the war going on around her and her hopes for the future. As a result of a radio broadcast made by the Dutch government in exile asking people to save their wartime diaries for publication after the war, Anne decided to rewrite her diary entries. On August 4, 1944, the Nazis raided the secret annex and arrested the residents. Anne's entire diary, including the plaid book, notebooks, and loose sheets of paper, remained behind in the annex. Tragically, Anne Frank did not survive the Holocaust. Her father, Otto, the sole survivor among those who had hidden the secret annex, returned to Amsterdam after the war. Meep Gijs, a woman who had risked her life to hide the Franks, gave Otto Anne's diary, which she had hidden for almost a year. As he read the entries, he was deeply moved by his daughter's descriptions of life in the annex and her feelings about her family and the other residents. He decided to publish the diary so that readers would learn about the effects of the Nazi dictatorship and its process of dehumanization. In the immediate aftermath of the war, it was not easy for Otto to find a publisher for Anne's work. He was told that no one wanted to read about the Holocaust. Finally, a newspaper called Het Parole printed a story about Anne's diary that captured the interest of Contact Publishers, a Dutch firm. In June 1947, Contact published 1,500 copies of the first Dutch edition of the diary. Within years, the Contact edition was translated into German, French, and English. Today, this version is available in 67 languages and 31 million copies have been sold. In the secret annex, Anne's day began at a quarter to seven. She would take the screens down from the windows and then the morning ritual in the bathroom would start, as one by one the group in hiding prepared for the day. There was a strict schedule because by 8.30, the annex had to be completely silent. That was when work began for the staff of the warehouse. They didn't know there were people hiding in the secret annex. Because the group's helpers in the office had not yet arrived, any sound might betray them. Even the toilet was a no-go area, as the soil pipe ran right through the warehouse. Shh, father. Quiet, Otto. Shh. Pim, it's 8.30. Come here now, you can't run the water anymore. Walk quietly. Even after the helpers started work in the office above the warehouse, the people in hiding still had to be quiet. By then, any noises from the hiding place heard in the warehouse would seem to come from the offices. They would spend the rest of the morning reading, studying and preparing lunch. Anne was doing a stenography course together with Margot and Peter and also learned French, German, algebra, and history. At half past 12, the warehouse workers would go out to lunch. The helpers and the people in hiding would eat together in the annex. Then, at one o'clock, they would turn on the radio for the latest news from the BBC. The helpers would stay until about quarter to two, then go back to work. At that point, the people in hiding could have a nap. Anne used the time to study and to write. By about four o'clock, it was time for coffee and dinner preparations would start. The warehouse workers went home at 5.30. Their helper, Bep Voskiao, usually popped in after that to ask if any of them needed anything. 
When she, too, had left for home at quarter to six, the people in hiding would spread out throughout the building. With everyone gone, they could emerge safely from their hiding place and even go into the front section of the building. Herman Van Pels would check the day's mail. Peter Van Pels fetched the bread left for them in the office. Otto Frank typed, presumably business letters. Margot and Anne did some office work for the helpers, such as filing letters, and August Van Pels and Edith Frank would cook the evening meal. They also washed themselves in the office kitchen, the only available hot water. After dinner, the group would read or chat or play games. The windows were blacked out as evening fell and preparations for the night began at nine. Furniture had to be moved to make rooms ready to sleep in. Just as in the morning, the group followed a strict schedule for the bathroom, one after another. Anne's turn was from 9 to 9.30. After that, the secret annex gradually fell silent. The video you just watched showed life in the annex for Anne and seven other people for two years. Now, imagine that you and your family had to go into hiding in order to survive and avoid being separated from each other. How would you feel about leaving your home and friends? How would your family get along in a small space for an extended period? Pause the video now and write on your notes. Part 2. The Frank Family Anne Frank, born on June 12, 1929, was the second daughter of Otto and Edith Frank, both from respected German-Jewish families engaged in commerce for many generations. Anne and her older sister, Margot, were raised in Germany in an atmosphere of tolerance, the Franks had friends of many faiths and nationalities. Otto Frank served honorably as an officer in the German army during World War I. However, the circumstances of the early 1930s dramatically altered the situation for the Frank family. The Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis, ascended to power in 1933 and launched a campaign to rid Germany of its Jewish citizens. The Nazis blamed the Jews for the economic, political, and social hardships that had befallen Germany, Though less than 1% of the German population was Jewish, many German Jews felt this to be a passing phenomenon, while others, including the Frank family, decided to leave Germany altogether. The Franks decided to move to Amsterdam, or the Netherlands, which had been known for centuries as a safe haven for religious minorities. In the summer of 1933, Otto Frank left Frankfurt for Amsterdam to set up a branch of his brother's company called the Dutch Opecta Company, which produced pectin an ingredient used in making jams. By the mid-1930s, the Franks were settling into a normal routine in their apartment. The girls were attending school, the family took vacations at the beach, and their circle of Jewish and non-Jewish friends grew. Unfortunately, the Franks' belief that Amsterdam offered them a safe haven from Nazism was shattered when, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands and the Franks were once again forced to live under Nazi rule. In the first years of the occupation, Anne and Margot continued to socialize with their friends and attend school, but the Nazi administration, in conjunction with the Dutch Nazi Party and civil service, began issuing anti-Jewish decrees. Fortunately, Otto Frank, in anticipation of this decree, had already turned his business over to his non-Jewish colleagues, Victor Kugler and Johannes Kleiman. By 1942, mass arrests of Jews and mandatory service in German work camps were becoming routine. Fearful for their lives, the Frank family began to prepare to go into hiding. They already had a place in mind, an annex of rooms above Otto Frank's office in Amsterdam. In addition, people in the office staff at the Dutch Apecta Company had agreed to help them. These friends and employees not only agreed to keep the business operating in their employer's absence, they agreed to risk their lives to help the Frank family survive. Mr. Frank also made arrangements for his business partner, Herman Van Pels, along with his wife, August, and their son, Peter, to share the hideaway. While these preparations were secretly underway, Anne celebrated her 13th birthday on June 12, 1942. On July 5, 1942, her sister, Margot, received a call-up notice to be deported to a work camp. Even though the hiding place was not yet ready, the Frank family realized that they had to move right away. They hurriedly packed their belongings and left notes implying that they had left the country. On the evening of July 6th, they moved into their hiding place. A week later, on July 13th, the Van Pels family joined the Franks. On November 16th, 1942, the seven residents of the secret annex were joined by its, by its eighth and final resident, Fritz Pfeffer. For two years, the Franks were part of an extended family in the annex, sharing a confined space and living under constant dread of detection and arrest by the Nazis and their Dutch sympathizers. 
At approximately 10 a.m. August 1944, the Frank family's greatest fear was realized. A Nazi policeman and several Dutch collaborators appeared at the business having received an anonymous phone call about Jews hiding there and charged straight for the bookcase leading to the secret annex. An Austrian Nazi forced the residents to turn over all valuables. When he found out that Otto Frank had been a lieutenant in the German army during World War I, he treated the family with a little more respect. The residents were taken from the house, forced onto a covered truck, taken to the central office for Jewish immigration, and then to Westernstein's prison. Two of the helpers were also imprisoned for their role in hiding the prisoners. The Nazi and Dutch police left the secret annex a mess. They had emptied Otto Frank's briefcase, which held Anne's diary, onto the floor to fill it with valuables. The floor was strewn with clothing, paperwork, and other belongings of those who had been hiding there. Meep and Bep returned to the annex and found Anne's diary and family photo album in the clutter. Meep brought the diary downstairs, where she kept it hidden in her desk. About a week later, the Nazis emptied out the entire annex. The members of the annex were eventually transported to the Auschwitz camp. Upon arrival at Auschwitz, the men were separated from the women. Hermann van Pels was the first to die. He was murdered in the gas chambers on September 6th. Fritz Pfeffer was moved to a different concentration camp in Germany, where he died on December 20th, 1944. In October 1944, Anne, Margot, and Mrs. Van Pels were transported to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Germany. Edith Frank remained in the women's subcamp at Auschwitz, where she died on January 6, 1945. Thousands died from planned starvation and epidemic at Bergen-Belsen, which was without food, heat, medicine, or elementary sanitary conditions. Anne and Margot, already debilitated, contracted typhus and grew ever sicker. Both Anne, 15 years old, and Margot, 19 years old, died in March 1945. Mrs. Van Pels was transported to a camp in Czechoslovakia where she died in the spring of 1945. Her son Peter was sent from Auschwitz on a death march. He survived the march but died in Mauthausen in Austria on May 5, 1945, a few days before the camp was liberated. Otto Frank, the only resident of the annex to survive the Holocaust, returned to Amsterdam after the war. He was totally unaware of the deaths of his daughters. He searched all possible leads to locate them before learning from a woman who had been with the sisters in the barracks at Bergen-Belsen that they had died. Otto also discovered that his wife, the Van Pels family, and Fritz Pfeffer had all died in the Holocaust. Meep continues to live in Amsterdam where she is active in educating people about the Holocaust and its lessons for today's society. Otto Frank found it difficult to settle permanently in Amsterdam with its constant reminders of his lost family, so he moved. Otto Frank died on August 19, 1980, at the age of 91. So why is the diary of a 13-year-old girl so important? We get a glimpse into what life was really like during the Holocaust. Despite her horrible circumstances, we can learn a lot from Anne's positivity and her thinking. As she states in her diary, In spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart.